All right. Um, last time we looked at sort of our general uh, template, uh, if you will, or general recipe for JavaScript. And uh, much of what we're going to do is an elaboration. Now, again, much easier said than done. The devil's in the details and all that sort of stuff. But if you remember, the template was something like this. All right. We have a user event that sets the ball rolling. User events are attributes on HTML tags. Which HTML tag? Well, the HTML tag that you want the user to interact with. All right. So if you had a series of thumbnails that you wanted the user to click and change the image on the page based on the thumbnail that they clicked, the HTML elements that the user is interacting with are the individual thumbnail images. So that's what would have the event. The events start with the word on, and they are pretty much the, the things that you would expect uh, the users to be able to interact with the web page on mouse over, on mouse out, on click, on key down, on key up. There's a whole set of them, and we'll, we'll sort of build our way through them. Um, the attribute, again, on click, for example, we then put within double quotes some JavaScript statement, some statement in the JavaScript language. Now, it can be a statement that does what we want it to do directly, or it can be a function call to say, hey, go and execute this little bit of code. The advantage of writing a function call, uh, there's a couple of them. Uh, one we'll see um, is that we can use the same bit of code to do several things. That's actually sort of what we're going to evolve to uh, in today's example. Um, the other advantage is simply a readability thing. If we have five or six instructions to, to execute, um, rather than stringing out those instructions on one big line separated by semicolons, we just make our single function call and those statements are grouped together. The other component that we talked about in our template is the document object model. And the document object model is uh, a way for JavaScript to access and manipulate pieces of the screen, pieces of the web page, elements on the web page, objects on the web page. And we do it by first pointing at the thing that we want to change, and then by saying and identifying what we want to change about it. So those three things sort of uh, comprise a template. The HTML event, the JavaScript code and the syntax for all, for all of the JavaScript statements, and lastly, the document object model to point to and change stuff on the screen. Let's look at the example that we had last time and I'll see if you have any questions. What this is, is this is just a very simple example where we have a study guide where the answer initially is, is, is uh, hidden and then when the user clicks on the uh, button, the answer gets shown. So there it is. All right. I click show answer and the answer gets shown. And we played around a little bit uh, of not just making it visible but changing the color of it as well. All right. Let's look at the code that does that. All right. This is a good example, a, a simple example, but a good example, I think, of the way the three pieces of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript work together to, to make a, a unified page. Remember, HTML is uh, the content of the web page. So if we look at the HTML for this, oops, the HTML contains everything. It contains the question. It also contains the answer. All right. So the HTML has the content. Now that some of the content, in our case the answer, is controlled via the CSS. The CSS controls the visibility uh, of the element and really controls every aspect of the element's appearance. 
So the fact that we can see or not see answer one is is set through the CSS. Yes. Um, where do I put, uh, in other words, if you look like in a script tag, yeah. there's a, uh, um, strictly speaking, I should put in uh, that the language is JavaScript, but if you don't, it's assumed to be JavaScript. It's by default, it's JavaScript. So, yeah, you don't, you don't have to worry about that. Really, that's the only um, scripting language that's truly uh, cross-browser compatible. Um, in the old days, uh, in Internet Explorer, you used to be able to use VBScript. I don't even know if that's even true anymore. All right, probably still is, but you, why would you want to do that? You're you're immediately, um, you know, limiting your 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 usability to uh, just one platform. In, in other than JavaScript, you need to define it, right? Yeah, and probably for good practice, you probably should put it in for for JavaScript too for completeness. But again, I'm I'm really not aware. I've never I've never on a I've never on a website wrote written script in any language other than JavaScript. All right. Not to say that at some point in time there'll be super JavaScript or JavaScript plus plus or whatever. All right, and then it will be necessary. But but for now, uh, the assumption is that it's JavaScript. All right. Content. This is the content of the page. The visual aspects of it are controlled via CSS. So the fact that initially the question is shown, but the answer isn't, is controlled via CSS. The piece that JavaScript adds is the interactivity. By interactivity, what do we mean? The user does something, the page somehow responds to it without going back to the server and necessitating a complete reload of the page. All right. So, how do we make it visible? Here's our event on click. All right. It's on the button tag. And we have in our double quotes, we have show answer, then parenthesis, parenthesis. What does that do? Again, what that does is show answer is a function that I defined. Where did I define it? I defined it up here in the head section. It's a good idea to put the functions that you define in the head section. All right, and then you have the code that calls those functions in the body section. Why do you suppose that is? Oh well, yeah, there's a readability aspect of it. So yeah, that part's good. So the web page knows what it's doing when it gets to the function. Yeah, exactly. By putting it in the head section, that guarantees that any time you go to invoke that script in the body, that that script has been loaded. You could conceivably, while a page was still loading, all right, click that button. Well, if the script is in the head, then you know that that function's been loaded already. If I had that script tag at the very bottom of the HTML, that script might not have, have loaded yet. All right. Again, a small point, but the readability thing is a good reason as well. Yes. Is the function a reserved word? The word function is a reserved word, yes. In other words, that's what identifies that it's a JavaScript function. Notice, again, we have the name of the function then. We have blank parentheses. Uh, I believe the second example we look at today, we'll start actually using those. But for now, there's, no uh, there's no, nothing in the parentheses. We then have these braces, curly brackets, whatever you want to call them. These things in JavaScript are used to group things together. All right? Group together uh, a chunk of, in this case, a chunk of code. All right? It's used for other reasons as well. And it, it, it's always used as sort of a grouping uh, uh, element. And it can be nested, and just like, or in a similar manner that tags are nested. All right? They come in pairs, so when you have a start, you need an end. All right? And what this says, quite simply, is from this to this is the function. Show answer starts here, it ends here. Now, 
Today's a particularly good example to, uh, day to, to say this, but take a look at me here. Do I look like a neat person? No, I'm not a particularly neat person. All right. Um, go in my office, you'll see books, not as bad as Huffman, but still there's, bo <laughs> there's books all over the place. All right. Go home and you'll see all kinds of stuff laying around, probably where it doesn't belong. However, look at this code. <laughs> the one thing in life that I stress to be neat about is the way the code is written. It's not immediately evident in this example because this is a small enough example, all right? But notice what I've done. I have my start script tag and end script tag, indented. Everything between there and there is JavaScript. I have my function, parenthesis, uh, left brace, right brace that lines up with the F in function. All right? At a glance, if I take my glasses off and I literally, with my vision, I can't read any word in that function, but I know the function starts there and ends there. Because I can, well, I can sort of see the word function, and this middle section here I know is the code. Um, you don't do this for the computer's sake, you do this for your sake, right? Because why is it important to make code uh, readable? For maintainability purposes, because uh, you're going to come back. And when we start adding more stuff in here, like loops and if statements and other functions and so on and so on and so on, the, the, the proper indenting and, and representation of those brackets will become important. All right? Browser doesn't care. All right? The browser is like Honey Badger. Right? Doesn't care. Oh, come on. Don't tell me no, no one's seen the Honey Badger video. All right. Your assignment for next Monday. Go to YouTube and watch the Honey Badger video. All right? A little bit of foul language in it. So if you're particularly sensitive to that, then, then you can skip this one. All right. At any rate, we do that for neatness, and we can see how that's indented. The two slashes make a comment. And again, comments are put in for readability. This probably isn't a very good comment. Why do I say that's not a very good comment? Yeah, it pretty much just explains the syntax of the statement down below. Now, I guess in a class, that, that's OK, because I'm trying to explain the syntax of that. But when you're writing actual code, the assumption is that the person reading the code knows the language. So I don't need to say, this is what that does. You know, I've seen, you know, I've seen comments that look like this. Like that, set x to 1, x equals 1. Well, anyone that knows the language knows that that's what x equals 1 does. The point is, is your comment should explain not necessarily what's being done, but why you're doing it. What is x? Maybe x is keeping track of how many guesses a person makes. Maybe you're playing a guess a number game, and x is keeping track of how many guesses a person made, or whatever. So a better comment might be something like, Show the answer when show answer button is clicked. Yeah. That tells you why you're doing it. All right. Yeah, OK. That's the function that gets called when the show answer button is clicked. And therefore, I'm showing the answer. So that's sort of a better sort of comment than just sort of just repeating what the instruction says, but in, in English. At least that's my opinion. Um, all right. Any questions about this one? Oh, let's, let's look at these, these two things. Document on this web page. Document, we were talking a little bit before class, is an object. What is an object? Uh, an object is uh, an entity, a structure, that has multiple attributes, and multiple methods, method function being pretty much the same thing. 
get element by ID is a method. So, what I'm doing is I'm calling on the document object the get element by ID method and I'm passing that method the argument of answer one. Effectively what that does is that points to the thing on the page that has the ID of answer one, which is the answer to that question. So we're now pointing at it. This simply points at it. Well, what do we want to do to it now that we pointed at it? Well, we want to change something about the style of it. What about the style? We want to change the visibility property of it. And what do we want to change the visibility property to? We want to change it to visible. The line below it is virtually identical except we're changing a different style property. All right. The style itself is an object and it has multiple properties. It has the visibility, it has the color, it has the background color, it has all these properties. All right. How do I know the names to call those properties? Well, they're simply the same name I use in CSS most of the time. All right. Most of the time. So if I want to change the style's visibility, it's style.visibility. Same thing I have in the CSS code. If I want to change the color, I change the color. I suppose the one exception to that are, are, are properties that contain a dash. So for example, background color gray let's say, in JavaScript you don't use the dash, you would say background color like that. Then I could change it to be yellow maybe. Oops. All right, let's make sure this works. All right, sure enough, it changed it to be yellow. So that's the one exception, uh, I guess not the one exception, but the one kind of exception that you have to simply using the property name. If the property name contains a dash, then you eliminate the dash and capitalize the first letter. So I could refer to any property. If I want to change the, you know, um, top. The position of it. Can I change it? Yeah. Document dot um, get element by ID. Point to that. Style top equals something. So I can move stuff around the screen. All right. It's always a lot of fun to write a little code, a little snippet of code, and um, I encourage you to try this because it's mischievous yet it's relatively harmless. Write a little chunk of code that moves a button when you put your mouse over it so you can't click on it. It's a lot of fun. All right. Try it. Play with it. See if you come up with anything. Yeah. A lot of fun. After you've done watching the Honey Badger video this weekend, Labor Day weekend, right? And I know, you know, every time I see Labor Day weekend come up, it's like, what a great time to write some programs. So write a little program <laughs> to, uh, to move the button around when you put your mouse over it. Maybe, maybe we'll do that next Wednesday, you know. All right. At any rate, are there any questions about this example? Now let's do a little, little mind experiment. We won't actually go ahead and do this, but we'll think about doing this. What if I had a second question with a second answer? If it's written this way, what would I do? Well, I'd have a div. The ID would be question two. All right. I'd have input show uh, on click. Can't call the show answer function, right? Because the show answer function would show the answer to question one. I don't want to show the answer to question one. I want to show the answer to question two. So what would I do? Well, I'd probably make a duplicate of this function. And instead of calling it show answer, I'd call it show answer two. And really the only thing different 
would be the thing that I'm changing the properties of. I'd do the identical process. I'd point to something on the screen, all right, on the page. Instead of answer one, though, this time I'm pointing to answer two. I'd access its style, set its visibility, all right. And really, um, it would be virtually the same code with just one thing changed in it, the, the, name, of the, the name of the div. Okay, so that's for two. Um, what, uh, what if there were three? Well, then there'd be three functions. What if there were 10? What if there were 50? You can go on and on and on. You see what we're doing, though, is we're duplicating a lot of code because we have virtually the same code, just one little piece of it um, uh, changed. That's where we're really going to start to exploit the value of these functions because this was a nice use of functions to sh sort of show how we can take and put a block of code so we don't have to have ugly streams of one statement following the other. But really the power of the functions is when we can call them with arguments. And what arguments are, are sort of like placeholders that you fill in with appropriate values. So that instead of always showing answer one or always showing answer two, we're going to tell that function what we want to show. And then the function will do that. Um, take Excel, for example. All right. In Excel, how many square root functions are there? I'm guessing there's one, right? I guess I don't really know. It might be two, but I don't see why you'd have two. There's just one, right? So in other words, if I want the square root of 144, I call the same square root function as if I wanted the square root of 25 or the square root of 36 or 49 or anything. It's only one function. Well, how does the function know what I want the square root of? You tell it. So, let's open up Excel. I teach, you know, if any of you know any of the people in, in my 121 class, don't tell them that I'm having to think about how to do this because I should know this off the top of my head. Okay, so I think it's that. So, square root 144 shows me 12. Can put in another cell. Whoops. Um, So there's one square root function, I tell it what the square root function needs to operate on. I tell it what the square root function needs to do its thing on. And then it does it. All right? Can you imagine how crazy it would be if there was a different square root function for every number? All right? There's square root 1, square root 2, square root 3. Well, that's absurd. Not even worth mentioning. All right? So there's a square root function, and you tell it what you want to operate on, what integer you want to operate on. Now, in the case of square root function, the argument is a number. It might not be an integer. You might be able to put decimals in two. So I might have misspoke at first. All right? But the point is, all right, is that there's one square root function, and to calculate a square root, what do you need to give it? You need to give it the number that you want the square root of. What does it give back to you? it gives you the square root. All right, fair enough. You tell it what you want the square root of, it gives you what the square root is. Think of it like a person that knows their square root table up, down, and sideways. You know, uh, Bill, you know, hey Bill, what's the square root of um, 225, 15? You told him what you wanted, he tells you the answer. Now, other functions in Excel are more complicated, right? There's a payment function. 
that calculates a loan. And I don't know if you can see, but the payment function, to calculate the loan, you, you, you don't just, just give it one thing, right? The square root, you just give it one thing, the number you want the square root of. For a loan, though, you have to say, gee, what's the interest rate? How many periods are there? And what's the loan for? All right? Yeah, in this particular case, there's, there's three required arguments and two optional arguments. All right. Um, the important thing, though, is to do this, we have to give it three ingredients. You have to give it three pieces, you know. Um, you know, um, if you go to, um, you know, if you go and buy a car from someone, you know, and uh, you're, you're negotiating price with the person, you want to know what your payments are going to be. All right, you know, the guy will, you know, the sales rep will look around and tell you what the interest rate is and we'll, and we'll say, well, gee, how many months do you want it for, finance it for? Four years, five years, you know, three years, you know, how much you're putting down? That's going to affect what the value of the loan is. And then they'll give you the answer. So if you get the interest rate from the bank, if you get the number of payments that you want to make on it and you get the, the total amount of the loan, they can tell you that. If you're missing any of those ingredients, it can't give you an answer, right? Those are a necessary piece. Now, these functions are the same way, all right? I'm going to take the example we had last time, and I'm going to revise this to use an argument in the function. Now, if you think about it, what I want to do is I want to have one button, all right, for this question, to show answer one. I then want to have a second question and answer. I'll just copy this big chunk of code. What does CSS stand for? So I'm putting the content on the page in the HTML. Through the CSS code, I'm making sure that the visibility and the, the way it looks is the way I want it to be. And in the JavaScript, I'm going to go and I'm going to put the interactivity in. Now to do this, I'm going to make two changes to the, to the code, or make a couple changes here. First of all, I'm going to pass, or well, let me, let me rephrase this. What do I need to pass to the show answer function to get it to work? For a square root, I had to pass a number. For this show answer, what do I need to pass to it? Pardon me? Can you speak up? Uh, there's a few things I could pass to it, depending on what approach I want to take. One thing I could do is I could pass the number of the question I want to show. All right? What's another thing I could pass? Yeah, the name of the div that I want to show. They're roughly the same. I would not express a preference one way or another. It's probably simpler to, to pass the ID, all right? So we'll do that. Um, for last, maybe we'll look at, at the other, other way to, to pass the number. So I'm going to say arg ID. What does arg ID represent? That's a placeholder for the name of the div, for the, not the name rather, but the ID of the div that I want to show, all right? Just like whoever wrote Excel has in their code some name that's going to represent the value that we're going to give that square root function or the value that we're going to give uh, the payment function. In fact, they even showed you what the names were, right? There was uh, NPR, I think, for number of payments. May, uh, I don't remember what it was. There was a, a rate or, or, and there was a PVAL for present value of the loan, all right? So those are the names of the arguments. Arg ID is going to be the placeholder. When we call the function, we have to give it what we want this function to operate. Just like in Excel, when we call a function, we have to give it what we want the square root function to operate. I'm going to change this not to use answer1, but to accept as an arg uh, or to, to display whatever is in that placeholder.
So we've made this function way more flexible than it was before, right? Because originally that function could make visible a div that's name was answer1. That's all that function could do. It served one purpose. Now, this function can show a div of any name. All right? So if we had 100 questions, how many of these do we need? One, right? We just call it with 100 different values of the div we want to change. Now, I'm saying calling the function. That means down here in the code where I actually want it to go and do that. Here's why I have to give the value of the function. So here I say the value of the argument for the function, rather. Here, I'm going to say, when they click on the first button, show the answer for the answer one div. For this one, show answer, answer two. Let's make sure that this works. All right, works, works. All right, and it's way more flexible and it's way better. And it's way more maintainable, right? Because the way I did it the first round on Monday, I'd have to copy that function for every single thing I wanted to, to show. And then what if I, ch I wanted to change something? Like I didn't want the background color to be yellow anymore. I wanted it to be light blue. Well, I'd have to go change all those 50 different functions if I had 50 questions. Here, I just make the change in one place. All right. I swear, I think, I don't remember when this was, but I think at some point I decided why I like software development. Software development is one of those fields where if you're lazy and you don't want to do a lot of work and you come up with a clever way to not have to do a lot of work, you're doing a great job. All right? Many other fields, if you are trying to get out of doing work, you're a slacker, right? You know? You're shirking your responsibility, you know? Could you imagine a mechanic like, well, I'm going to figure out a way where I don't have to work, right? No, you don't want that person working on your car. A programmer, however, provided they're using clever means, all right? So maybe there are other careers that that's valid for, but provided they're using clever means to do so, saving yourself work is actually a good thing, all right? It's a universal truth that anything you write is going to need to be changed at some time in the future. Therefore, you, adapt, or, or you adopt these good programming practices to take advantage of that, all right? And, and, to, and to make it, make your code uh, better, more easy to read, and, and so on. Questions about this example? Whoops. Yeah, I know. Questions about this example? To the people who said, give it the number of the question, we can pretty easily do that. Give it the number. And then we can change this to say, hard code the word answer and slap the ID on after it. And that should work as well. Let me verify that. I don't think this machine is like in the loop. Uh, so, I mean, it's still running XP, I think, so, which is fine by me, but, all right. So, again, that's an alternate way to do it. I could just give the number of the div, and then by coding to say, take the word answer and tack onto the end of it the number of the answer, and that would work as well. Notice, again, the word answer is in quotes because that represents a hard-coded value. I always literally want the, the letters A-N-S-W-E-R. 
arg ID is not in quotes because I don't literally want the letters A R G I D. I want the value of that variable. And that variable, of course, is the argument that gets passed here. All right. I probably will upload this one too, this version of it. We have an old, a slightly older version of it, but I'll, I'll upload this one too. Let's look at this one now. This one has some nice things in it, and uh, probably the one difference between this is this has a show all. All right. And notice when I show answer, the name of the button changes to hide answer. And then I can hide it again. All right. Show all, unfortunately, doesn't change the hide all. But we can correct that either today or, or I was going to say Monday, but that's right. We do not have class Monday. All right. Yeah, I know. It's disappointing. Well, you folks are lucky because I canceled two classes this week, but I didn't cancel any of of, of this class. So part of the reason I actually did that and part of the reason that I was cursing to myself lying on the couch at 4.30 saying I want to stay home and nap, all right, is knowing that Labor Day uh, is, is coming up Monday. So we're going to be missing a class anyhow. All right, let's look at this and let's see what's the same and what's the difference. All right. Um, the event part is largely going to be the same. There's just a bunch of on-click events, right? The DOM is going to be very similar. We're going to be using document get element by ID. What's going to be different is we're going to be maybe accessing some different properties or, or whatever. So let's look at this one. All right. First thing I did is I changed the name of the answer, a or, or not the answer, the argument, um, not the argument, the function. <laughs> Instead of show answer, I've changed it to show hide answer. All right. And the difference is, is I'm able to look to see if it's visible or not. If it's visible, I hide it. If it's invisible, I show it. So it's a little toggle switch that goes back and forth. Let's start out and look at that and see how that piece of code works. It's really just a simple sort of extension uh, from the previous example. So I have on click for that button, show hide answer, and I'm giving the argument of one. So let's look at this function. Show hide answer. I'm passing the number. Let's say I give it the argument of one. So I want to do this to the first um, button on the screen. I have two variables. Does anyone care to define what a variable is? What's a variable? It's a place to store something that you can give a name and you can store something in it. All right. JavaScript's kind of funny about variables. Um, JavaScript is what's called a weakly typed language, which means um, that you don't have to specify what kind of data you're going to put into a variable. Some of you might have done some VB programming before where you declare something, you declare a variable, you have to, see, first of all, you have to declare the variable, then you have to say what you're going to store in it. So, yeah, what kind of variable it is. Are you going to store a string in it? Are you going to store an integer? What are you going to store? In JavaScript, you really don't do that, right? JavaScript sort of figures out, all right, what the variable is. And that's called weakly typed, and that can actually lead to some problems. All right. In other words, if you have two string variables that both contain one, and you say variable one plus variable two, it thinks you want to concatenate them. So you don't get one plus one equals two, you get one plus one equals one one. All right. But anyhow, in this case, safe enough to do this. I'm creating two variables. So I'm creating two storage locations. One has the name of button, or BTN rather, and one has ANS as a value. 
And again, just like I did before, this button variable gets the word button hard coded, so it's literally B U T T O N. followed by the number that is the argument to this function, in this case, 1. I can't stress enough, especially when you're first learning a programming language, that it can be beneficial to do this. To write on a sheet of paper, this is my variable, this is what I'm putting in the variable. All right? And essentially, you play computer. All right, you, you interpret the instructions and anytime you assign a variable, you um, write the value in your little, um, in your little uh, sheet of paper with, with the variables. Let's look at this statement a little bit closer. This is called an assignment statement. All right. The way assignment statements work, and they work just about the same in any programming language, so if you've seen one programming language, this works the same. You take what's on the right side of the equal sign, and you evaluate it. Now, in the case of, of numbers, the evaluation is like you do the math. You know, you might say this times that, or this divided by that. In the case of strings, there's other ways to evaluate it, and Adding strings together is concatenate. So I'll take the word button and I'll slap the number on the end of it. And again, in this example, we're assuming it's one. And we store that in that variable. Second statement says the variable ans equals answer, the literal in, in quotes, plus number. So ANS has the value of answer 1. This is one of those things that may sound self-evident to do this. And you're like, why do I need to do this? Why even talk about it? But it's very valuable, especially, again, depending on your programming background and how much programming you're done. It's very good to like, break it down and think through how it's doing every step of the way. All right. Let's look at what this third statement says. Third statement is different than any statement we've encountered. It's an if statement. All right. In the first example that we went over, the statements were simply assignment statements, sequential statements, one after another. Do the first statement, do the second statement, do the third statement. An if statement can alter sort of the sequence. It's a branching. It allows the program to choose one of two paths based on a condition. All right. The if statement looks like this. I'm going to draw the shell of an if statement on this sheet of paper. And I hope after you see this example and look at it closely, you'll see why someone that dresses like me is still obsessed about the way the code looks, because this will get very confusing real fast. I have my function, whatever it's called. I have the curly brackets. One of the instructions in the function could be an if statement. All right. Like that. Now. The way these are lined up give you an idea of how they're interpreted. All right? But really, this one goes with that one. Doesn't matter where it's indented, it's the fact that this is the left, or this is the right bracket that follows this left bracket. All right? And they're nested, so both of these are contained within this. One of the things I suggest if you're getting an error is to actually print it out and draw to say that, let's see, this goes with this, this goes with this, this goes with this. Now, the way the if statement works is like this. All right, and again, there, there's slightly different ways you can do it, but we'll stick to this way first. 
the if statement has in parentheses a condition. All right? It has an expression or a condition that evaluates to a Boolean. All right? A Boolean is simply an expression that is either true or false. That's it. No, yes, no, maybe, no, none of the above, no, all of the above, yes or no, true or false. All right? Um, are my hours that I work this week greater than 40? Yes or no? Am I a salaried employee? Yes or no? Um, do I have health insurance through the college? Yes or no? Those are some of the if statements that you might see in a payroll program. They're all yes or no questions, and depending on the way those questions go, the calculation is going to go different. All right? Um, so you have this condition in the parentheses. That condition is evaluated, and the computer decides, the browser decides, is this condition true or false? Based on whether it's true or false, it will do this block of statements if it's true, this block if it's false. So, if the employee worked more than 40 hours, here would be the code to calculate their overtime pay. Here would be the time to calculate no overtime pay. All right? Now, you don't always have to have an else. You could have the if by itself, in which case if this expression is true, you do this. Otherwise, you skip it. All right? You don't do that block of code. And regardless of whether it's true or false, it continues with whatever statement follows this. Now, in our particular case, the end of the function follows it, so we're at the end. But if there were additional statements there, um, we'll, uh, we'll execute. I'm going to go a little over on time again. All right, I guess I'm, I only, you know, I, my morning classes was, was uh, canceled, so I got an extra 50 minutes worth of talking. Actually, Today's Wednesday, so I have an extra 50 minutes worth of talking. I hope I'll only use five of it. I'll save the other 45 when I get home. All right? Now, let's look at this specific example. The condition is, here's the if, just like I showed. The condition that gets evaluated is, is the value of the button equal to show answer? Now, let's watch, because this is a little bit different. One thing you should notice is it doesn't have the word style in there. All right? We're not dealing with an attribute of the CSS for this element. We're dealing actually with an HTML attribute. And the question I'm asking is document get element by ID. We should be used to that. Find something on the page. What are we finding on the page? We're finding the thing that has an ID equal to the contents of the variable BTN. Now, that's not enclosed in quotes. So we're not looking for an ID of BTN. We're looking at an ID. We're looking for, rather, an ID of something all right, that has an ID that's, that, that matches the contents of BTN. What are the contents of BTN? Button 1. All right. So, Find the thing on the page that has a ID of BTN. If its value What is value? It's an HTML attribute. All right. There's no dot style something or other. It's just dot value. So if you don't see the style there, it's referring to an attribute of the HTML element, not an attribute of the style of the HTML element. If the value is set to show answer, then look what I do. I make, if, if the button currently has a value of show answer, I can go and set my answer, all right, to visible. Whatever is in the variable ANS, which in this case is answer 1, I set that guy to visible. And then I change the 
value of the button. And what's the value of the button? The text that's on the button, the label that's on the button, I change it to hide answer. So I'm actually using the text of the button to store whether I should show or hide it. All right? It's one way to do it. There's a lot of ways I could have done this, but this is the way that, that I chose to do this one. If, however, the value wasn't show answer, in other words, it was hide answer, then what do I do? I hide it and change the text of the button to show answer. All right? Now, take a look at this. We'll look at this a little bit more next time. And we'll do a couple of things. One thing is my show all doesn't change the name of that. And we could probably do better on that. All right. We could also, if you look at the code, ooh, I'm repeating myself. I have the same line of code effectively two times. And if there were 10, there'd be 10. DLI, do not repeat yourself. This is a case where you'd get yelled at for not being lazy enough. All right? You didn't take the time to figure out a smart way so that if there were 100 questions, I would not have to have 100 lines. Show I'd answer one, show I'd answer two, and so on down the line. All right? So we'll look at a better way to do that. One last thing before we go, though. Whoops. Does anything look odd about this condition? The two equal signs, all right? Yeah, you, you, not a problem with the projector, and you're not seeing double or, or anything like that. In JavaScript, the equal sign is used two different ways. All right? One way that it's used is to assign the value to a variable. That's what we have up here. To assign the value to a variable, you use a single equal sign. So this variable gets set to, gets assigned this value. All right? That's how that works. Now, when two equal signs are used, it's not an assignment, it's a comparison. The two equal signs, think of it as asking the question, is this? equal to that. All right? And either is or it isn't. All right? So the single equal sign is used as assignment. The double equal sign is used for comparison. Now, if we were David Letterman and we're counting down the top 10 most common JavaScript errors, we've probably seen two of them so far. All right? Number one is what we talked about last time, the case sensitivity. The case has to match. So the document get element by ID has to be the proper case. Um, show hide answer, I could pick any name for that function, but I got to be consistent with the case that I use for it. So case is probably one of the top errors of JavaScript. The other one is the confusion about the equal signs. It's especially confusing for folks maybe that have done VB programming before. All right. The interesting thing is, is as you study these programming languages, JavaScript, C Sharp, Java, PHP, Perl, are all sort of, sort of built on one model. So most all of them use a double equal sign like this. All right. It's VB that's the oddball. Unfortunately, that's the class that, that's used uh, uh, as an intro for a number of reasons, and I'm not arguing that it was used as an intro here, but it does take a little bit of getting used to to realize that you need double equal sign. A third probably popular cause would be mismatching the curly brackets or the curly brackets in the wrong position. So you might have the right number of curly brackets, but if they're not nested properly, then you got a problem as well. All right. Uh, we'll continue to look at this one and to improve it. Uh, the goal when we're done with this is by simply looking at this example, we'll look at um, the, 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 the basic statements in any programming language. Assignment statements, conditional statements, and then finally iterations or loops. All right. I will upload sort of the middle example. We had the very first example that was posted uh, last time. We had sort of our 
end result, there was sort of one in the middle where I rewrote the function to use an argument. I will upload that example. The other two are already there. And then we'll see you over in lab.